Espionage News. Where to begin? Oh, at the beginning, since I last wrote the following things of note happened in the espionage realm that is obvious. There was a German coup plot thwarted, the RCMP had been found to be potentially compromised by the CCP, Brittany Griner had been released in a prisoner exchange and a Polish police chief had received an exploding gift from the Ukrainian embassy. It's been an interesting couple of weeks. Regarding the German coup plot. Remember QAnon, the German version of them, let's call them GQAnon, was amassing weaponry and ammunition. The German intelligence had already known of their plan for some time. However, at least 25 individuals were arrested in Germany, Romania, and Italy. But the network is said to be upwards of 10,000 individuals. There's a lot of details here worth to note down. The most prominent one is that they were being backed by Russia. I'm not surprised. Closer to home in Canada, the RCMP was reported to have had bought and installed radio and dispatch equipment produced by a manufacturer with ties to the CCP in a time where there are CCP police stations sprinkled all over the world. I wonder what use the CCP would have had for RCMP dispatch broadcasts. I guess we'll never know. Anyhow, at the Berkel College of Music in Boston, it was reported a student was caught stalking and harassing another student for putting up pro-democracy flyers, both of which are of Chinese descent. Brittany Griner has come home. She was detained the day before Russia invaded Ukraine. She was released in exchange for a notorious arms dealer that Nick Cage gets hard for. Anyhow, the week before the exchange, Paul Wellen, another American detainee in Russia was sent to hospital and prior to that was missing. Russian intelligence knows very well the divide in America and the West, it's quite possible they created it. So they know how to tear public opinion in two. I'm glad Brittany is home but her and Paul were always pawns. They both represented and were a symbol of the two supposed warring factions in the West. Paul, a Caucasian American male veteran, supposedly Republican, and Brittany, a black non-binary lesbian, obviously Democrat. Russia pinned the two against each other. Only one was able to be sent home. The Kremlin made that clear, think about that. How would you feel if your person was left behind? and off to the races the espionage artists went when she got back as well as prior. Also, the choice was made more complicated and hurtful while Paul was missing, than in hospital. It was made to seem he was in real peril. I assume he was. That's the disgraceful thing about it. The Kremlin is not only tearing apart families, mine included, with their propaganda. They're using living and breathing people as puppets in their sick game. Brittany was sent to a penal colony and for appearance sake. I'm sure Paul was put in mortal danger to end up in hospital. It sickens me. Finally and perhaps the most volatile, General Jaros Law, SCYMXZYK, Shimshik, the highest ranking police officer in Poland received a gift from a Ukrainian embassy. It was suggested to be a gift from the Ukrainians. It was a grenade launcher that was supposed to be empty. Guess what? It blew a hole in the ceiling and floor in the room. Jaros Law was in at the time. He suffered minor injuries but holy shit. There is more to come of this nature. One final note before I begin, animal eyes have been mailed to several Ukrainian embassies across Europe. No one was hurt. It was just gross. Gender relations in regards to the trans community. When you read that did you get a churning feeling in the ball of your stomach too? Are you anticipating me saying something horrible? To some hearts and minds perhaps I am. Disclaimer alert. I am fully supportive of people who wish to undergo procedures to change their sex. I empathize with people who feel one way on the inside and are sad because their outsides do not match. It's a sad and scary situation to be in. I proudly wear shirts with the LGBTQ flag all the time. Sometimes on a daily basis, anything that could be done to give everyone the respect they deserve should be done. With that out of the way I'll begin. Donald Trump. Where to begin? I guess it was a matter of time that I mention him. I'm sort of torn in my opinion of him. I'm not sure if he's a Russian agent or just another idiot who watched too much of the ill-conceived conspiracy theories in the 90s and early 2000s. Perhaps he spent too much time with Oliver Stone. I'm not sure, what I am certain of though is he is a loud personality, keeping the general public from having a needed conversation. What is a Trumpian speech? Have you heard someone complain of that guy in your network of friends or acquaintances who go on Trumpian rants? What is a Trumpian rant? It used to be any time anyone would criticize China. Now it's mainstream to know the CCP is probably up to no good. What else? When one would say BLM bad. I agree with him on that. 
Does that make me Trumpian? But I detest Trump. Does that make me even more Trumpian? I'm not sure what the rules are. Actually I do. I'm just building up to a finer point. This section regards transgender people. Trump has an affinity in ridiculing them. However, only while standing up for women's rights, the media always skips that part. Of course, I abhor hateful obscenities toward anyone but I must agree with him. Although I hate it, women's rights would be undermined if the trans community were to get their way in certain areas. One area in particular is sports. I'm not here to argue what to do. Although I think the issue is being resolved. I'm here to show that in the case of Donald Trump, I'm going to assume he is an espionage artist. His primary task is not pin one group against the other. It's to keep important conversations that need to be had suppressed. If Donald Trump wasn't all gung-ho on China in 2018 as well as being a disgusting individual, perhaps we would have caught on faster in regards to the CCP. What I mean is, because Donald was, China China China, the general public and politicians, particularly on the left wing, although they would agree they were reluctant to do so and be viewed as Trumpian. Do you see where I'm going with this? The general pattern with these espionage artists is that they bring up very important issues in one hand, but with the other they do or say horrible things. Yes. Having a transgender woman who only identifies as a woman but physiologically still has prominently masculine traits is an issue in regards to competitive sports. Saying that is fine but ridiculing their worldview and sexual anatomy is never fine, especially at a political rally. That's what the espionage artists do in all controversial realms. They hijack the conversation. They keep the general public from having needed discussions on these important topics. A lot of the public shies away to their corner building an echo chamber on each side. May I just add that a joke is a joke. Before Dave Chappelle made fun of the way transgender people used the restroom, he made the same joke about women. That's comedy. Even though comedians very rarely have the deep understanding of these complexities. I'm sure Dave used that hack joke as a point. Why is this bad and not that? That said, that doesn't excuse someone running for president to make such a joke at their rallies. I'm not sure Trump was trying to make a point. He was trying to deepen the divide. I hope this section cleared a bit up. One last thing on Trumpian speeches or rhetoric. It's not only the content that makes a Trumpian speech, it's the demographic profile of the individual. Perhaps that's the most important aspect, perhaps I'm wrong. But they will rarely accuse old black men of Trumpian speeches or young black men for that matter. Perhaps it's easy to assume that black conservatives, young, or old do not exist. You'd be very mistaken. What the woke do is ignore them. Even if these prominent authors and media personalities try desperately to get in contact with them, the woke, dig their head in the sand or call these black conservatives multiracial white people. When an old white man goes on a rant against the woke mob mentality, this gentleman doesn't have to be saying anything hateful at all to be called Trumpian. All they need to do is question the finer points in the ideology of the woke theocracy. Of course, the woke want to be questioned because remember they're not trying to win, they're trying to be fought, especially by old white men. They want to use the darkest parts of western history like a shoe pressing on the faces of the youth who for the love of god never want to repeat what happened hundreds of years ago. Of course, old white men are the symbol for that history. The woke are making sure of that. Also remember the woke and mega are a Russian plot. What I laid out here in this section is just another way to distract from the fact that autocrats want to wreak havoc. They need the West out of the way first. Next time I'll explain the culture war regarding socio-economics. A quick note on the purpose of recessions. The purpose of recessions? What is this guy talking about? Aren't recessions a disaster, an accident no one saw coming? Aren't they the root of all evil, that put hard-working people out of jobs that they never find again? Isn't it that the world's elite are against the working woman and man? In everyday conversations, and as well in the news media, recessions are often referred to like this. However, I'm going to take some time out to explain how recessions are a natural part of our economy. I always noticed that on average, recessions have been happening once every decade, at least in the 20th century. I found that interesting, but I never quite understood why that is the case. Now however I do. Recessions can be caused by the central bank raising the national interest rate. The national interest rate is the lowest any bank can ask of a customer when taking out a loan. The higher the interest rate, the more loans will cost you to pay back. For most people, 
that means you either won't take out a loan because you couldn't afford it, or the amount of money available for borrowing is diminished. Naturally this means businesses and consumers can't spend as much. Spending stimulates the economy. If a business can't get the startup funds it needs to build out a manufacturing wing for a product, it will make less or none of it. This means that product remains expensive for the consumer. This means the consumer will buy less or none of it. This is a simplified example of an economic slowdown. You're probably asking why the F would the central bank want an economic slowdown? The reason the central bank raises the interest rates is because inflation begins to tick upward. Inflation can be caused by a lot of factors. I got into a few of them in the supply and demand chapter. However, I didn't explain in more detail, specific examples of inflation. Let's say Jack works for a small grocery store as a clerk. Business is really slow. He doesn't take note of this or care. However, he's a teenager who's more interested in flirting with the girls he works with and scrolling through social media. To Jack, this is a really nice gig. He gets to basically slack off because there is very little clientele. Now, even though business is slow at Jack's small grocery store, it sometimes turns a profit maybe once or twice a quarter overall. However, the business over time is losing just a little less than it makes. This makes it somewhat economically viable during an economic growth cycle. However, because the store doesn't sell very much stock, the economic chain of events is cut pretty short. This is inflationary eventually. While national interest rates are low, the store owner can apply for more and more loans to kick the kin down the road in hopes for the business to pick up. It probably won't. What usually happens is owners of such businesses stop investing in needed infrastructure. The money generated is from loans and not from clientele. The more loans he takes out the more loan payments he has to pay back. This puts a strain in his ability to make the necessary adjustments to his business so that it may become more successful over time. Usually right before the end of a decade or right at the beginning of one inflation has been creeping up. What I've noticed is central banks tend to let inflation heat up to around 6% before reacting. At this point, they begin to raise interest rates. The point of raising interest rates is to bring the inflation rate to 2%. What the Fed is trying to do, although for political reasons, they will not specifically say it is, they want businesses such as Jack's Grocery Store to shut. National interest rate hiking cycles are like a test. If you can last a hiking cycle, you're doing something right. If not, it's time to sell or declare bankruptcy and start over. Jack's Grocery Store is causing inflation because they're not producing enough. The job losses that come with the recession are sought after. Not because the Fed wants people out of work. It's because they want people to be looking for whatever work there is left. After all the zombie corporations, as establishments such as Jack's Grocery Store are called, cease to exist. It's not often acknowledged, but the unemployment number is the amount of people out of work who are actively looking for work, not people who just don't work. Also, this number is a number in flux. People are coming in and out of the state of unemployment all the time. Usually, the unemployed find themselves in another job shortly after out of necessity. Bills have to be paid, livings have to be made. At times like these people change career paths, moving from one sector to another. During this period is when you hear of massive layoffs. Also, during this period is when you hear of sometimes staple institutions shutting their doors or being bought out, it's a cleanup. Some even call it a reset, not the great reset conspiracy that some people are sticking to. Just a general non-conspiratorial reset. That happens every growth cycle to keep the economy humming away without mess. It's like an oil change for your car or cleaning out the lint filter in your drying machine. If you don't get an oil change, your engine will cease and possibly form a crack and explode. If you don't clean out your lint filter, your dryer can probably burn down your house. Yes, it can cost $100 every 3 months to change your oil leaving you without a car for 45 minutes, or gasp, a whole afternoon. But it's a small price to pay for keeping your vehicle running smoothly. It will also save you from a lot of hurt in the long term. Anyhow, during this period of high interest rates, inflation begins to come down. Prices start to regulate as the workforce find themselves in whatever is left. The GDP starts to tick up to a healthy growth rate. Once the inflation rate stays steady at 2% the Fed stabilizes the interest rate to be more accommodating to businesses and consumers. Then the whole rodeo starts again until the next time inflation starts again. You may ask, why does the Fed allow people to open businesses that don't do well, 
Why are we allowing people to make mistakes and default on their loans? One reason is because the Fed isn't a governing body of people. Actually, it seems to be more of a reactive institution. It reacts to government policy and the actions of the civilian population, not particularly due to their demands but due to their actions. Another reason why the Fed doesn't have a say in who can open a business or take out a loan is because the purpose of a free market is to stimulate growth and innovation. No one knows who will reinvent the wheel. What I mean to say is no one knows who can create a product or service that will elevate humanity to a greater state. No one could have known Steve Jobs would have created the iPhone. So holding individuals back would not only be morally wrong but potentially a way to handcuff your economy from achieving the next great product or service. In order to achieve greatness, some fiscal eggs must be broken and periodically cleaned up. Some of those eggs may not crack. They may be solid gold, they'll remain until the next batch of eggs are ready to take the plunge. Another way to think of the recession and growth cycle is like home renovation. During the construction process, there is some destruction of an exterior wall. Lots of garbage and decay must be cleaned up. You have to live in your basement or garage for a time. It's a hassle. However, once the reno is finished, you have a wonderful new hobby room or new bathroom to enjoy. The culture war regarding socioeconomics. I started off this segment with an explanation of recessions because they're used in this culture war to pry a divide between socioeconomic classes. I want to refrain from saying rich and poor because, what does it mean to be poor? What kinds of people are poor? A lovely, sorry. I don't mean lovely. A troubling phrase that is beloved by segments of the news media and the far left and right is the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. What are they measuring here? Are they measuring the wages of people, or the amount of people with certain wages? Very certainly. I know they aren't taking account of anyone's age. The largest group of technically poor people in the workforce are part-time workers. The interesting thing about these part-time workers are, they are currently attending high school and college. Before we dissect the mystery of why these low earners are in high school and college, I would like to point out they aren't full-time workers. When these statistics are displayed on social media and by certain news organizations, it is never pointed out that these, poor, people are working part-time. If you don't put in the hours, you don't get the money. That's a very arrogant thing to say author, is something I could hear. Perhaps you're right or perhaps these individuals are choosing to have a limited amount of hours. Perhaps these individuals who are working these part-time jobs are not seeking out a 40-hour work week just yet. There must be something taking up their time. It must be school who fits this description. Students, most students are young. Also, they would rather die than work full-time at a McDonald's. They'd rather take some extra cash for video games and snacks between studies. They want to be a lawyer, not a floor supervisor at a Walmart. Let's dive deeper into this mystery. Oh, how? I love brain teasers like this. If these young students only work perhaps two days a week and make just enough for snacks and the odd video game, how do they pay the rent feed and clothe themselves? Oh my god. I totally forgot about mommy and daddy. When these statistics are displayed at an attempt to tug at your heartstrings, they're wrapping up students as examples of the poor. Of course, technically, they fit the description on paper because of course, they wouldn't claim they have a house, that's their parents' responsibility. Of course, I can dive deeper into the complexity, but I'll let you do that if you're so inclined. The reason I brought this up is because this topic is used to sow discontent between socio-economic classes. And also obviously there are cases where adults find themselves in a position where all they can find is part-time work. If an adult is in the position of working part-time at a grocery store and they have to pay their own way through life, better believe they'll have two jobs, perhaps two different sectors or something criminal. You should question someone who seems to pay the rent while working a part-time job at a coffee shop. Don't ask them questions. I mean, just wonder, and perhaps keep your distance from them unless you want some cocaine. Although that would be a serious concern, after some thought, it's quite possible that some people use the stock market as a passive income. Meaning, they don't need to break their back for 40 hours a week, their stock market portfolio fills in the gaps. That's probably a topic for a future book of mine. Anyhow, these memes on social media and reports by organizations that purport to be news are either purposely disregarding all the details in their argument or are lazy and stupid to what could be so obvious if you look into it. 
Most of it is active disinformation from people selling their agenda that the rich should be made into ground beef for pasta sauce. These organizations and social media accounts that spread these messages are propped up fiscally by the Kremlin and sympathizers especially in times of economic strife. These messages are pumped out daily. Arguments are had in the comments section. Flames of true hatred and discontent is felt and fanned by espionage artists pretending to be regular social media users. Not to mention certain social media influencers are espionage artists helping the Kremlin's cause. The rest of us are along for the ride. Some of us get swept one way or another. Hopefully we're all strong enough one day to see that we're being had. Before I finish, I want to add one more thing. Be weary of political figures who disparage the central banks for raising interest rates. If a public representative doesn't understand the reason central banks raise their rates, they have no place in governing others. It's fine for civilians who have so much on their plate, not to be bothered with the functioning of the central bank. They're not expected to know. However, this leaves them vulnerable to government representatives that are meant to be respected and trusted and meant to be looking out for their constituents' best interests. Perhaps these politicians are truly concerned with job losses connected to central bank hikes. However, if you are serious about government and policy, one should be well aware of the responsibility of the central bank. They should know that their policy is without political bias. They're an objective entity. Criticizing the actions of the central bank is a very dangerous game to play. Especially if you're a person in power, it may cause political chaos or even riots in the streets. Who wants that? I know someone who does want that for you, they're stationed in Moscow. That is food for thought. One final thing, a way to think about employment and the economy is one doesn't work for the sake of work. One works for the sake of creating or serving for another or many others. Think about that when looking for a job, consider your job security in that regard. Next time I'll speak about those who are made to believe in crypto and the reasons they do.